Rich Lau. I met him when he was a summer associate at Briggs and Morgan, 1980. Huh? No, no, like 90, 97, 98. <laughs> Sorry. It just seems like 1980. Um, Rich and I worked together at um, Briggs and Morgan. I was in the commercial part department. Rich was in the real estate and financial institution section. And, but I probably gave him more work than anybody else. And after his first year as an associate, I think he did work for like 23 different lawyers. And like, hey, we need a gatekeeper. Because he would just say yes. And uh, so they said, Jeff, you're not in our department, so you don't get to use him anymore. Well, then 60% of his work went away. And, and of course, all the good work went away. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but when I uh, decided in 2001 to start Redmond Law, conversation with Rich. I said, I have this list of clients. I don't know if any of them are going to come. I haven't talked to any of them. I'm not talking to them after I give, until I give my notice. But if we get good adoption, I'm going to call you, and you should give your notice and join me, which happened. And so I started Redmond Law in August. Um, by August 15th, all the clients had said, yeah, we're coming. I called Rich. We gave him a notice. Go ahead. You're fine. Um, and he, I think Rich started October 1st. And uh, it's been a great uh, partnership. Um, been fun to grow together. Uh, we, for the most part, we represent business owners actively engaged in their business. Um, and then Rich has developed um, a real expertise, I'm legally allowed to say that, in real estate. He's a Minnesota real estate specialist, which um, only these real estate specialists can actually advertise that they have an expertise in real estate. Otherwise, you're like me and say, well, I'm a real estate lawyer. There's 5,000 of us in Minnesota and only about 300 that have gone through all the hoops. Uh, most of those people are with big firms, so it's really quite... Um, an accomplishment for Rich to be a Minnesota real estate specialist. And then the last few years, and it's really evolved from the work of our clients, um, a real focus on employment law. So today, I guess, the topic is how to sexually harass. So you're up. So uh, when I started at uh, Briggs many years ago, uh, and Briggs had a, a magnificent library of, of law books probably tens of thousands of volumes. And I remember walking in as a, as a bright-eyed young uh, lawyer and, and seeing there were a couple of volumes there, and they were la labeled lying, cheating, and stealing. <laughs> so I asked, I asked one of the partners, I was like, is this a how-to book? He said, no, no, we got that down. <laughs> so I, I think, you're, I think uh, most employees have got how to sexually harass now. This is what happens when they come to you and say, hey, I've been sexually harassed. Then you as an owner, as a manager, uh, as a fellow employee, what do you do then? And so I'm just gonna try and talk very briefly about <laughs> what you should do. So it's easy to get uh, caught up in the emotion of handling a complaint. What typically happens is, as certainly as a business owner, someone comes to you and says, so and so made inappropriate remarks to me, or uh, did something to me that made me uncomfortable. And that, as a business owner, it's a difficult conversation because the emotions of, of that come into play. And it's, it's, it's both fear, it's resentment, it's condemnation. You, you, some often people get defensive or even judgmental. And it kind of falls into two camps. One is, well, you out for a payday? Uh, you know, why, why, you know, you, you kind of have this cynicism or skepticism about it. And the other side of it is, well, I can't believe this other employee, that's outrageous. I can't believe they did that to you. They should be fired right away. And so, and I say, hold on, wait. That's, I, I understand it, it's very emotional, it's very frustrating, but let's kind of let's take a step back. The biggest risk about receiving a sexual harassment complaint is how it's handled, actually. Huh. 
again, <coughs> it's about removing the, the motion from receiving that complaint and then focusing and following the process. Um, often people come to me and say, well, I received this complaint from this employee and you know, it's a really great, it's a really, the other person who was accused is, is really great and I, I don't want to fire them. If I fire them, I'll, I'll lose all my business. And I'm like, no, no. You're jumping to conclusions here. Let's, let's step back, let's figure out what happens. Do, you're, you're really your obligation as an employer, as an owner, is to investigate and to take action based upon that result, take appropriate action based on that result. So before you jump to any conclusions, let's figure out what happened. Um, the, so first, figure out what your role in the investigation is. Are you the right person? So someone's come to you and said, I've been harassed. And it takes a lot of trust for someone to come to you and, and say that. Because you're, they've identified you as, as someone they can talk to, someone they trust. And so all of a sudden, you have that role, but are you the right person to deal with it? If you're, whether you're the owner of the company or whether you're a coworker, you may not be the right person to handle what you just received. Um, who would be, we, we ask our, our clients to think about who would be the best fit. Would it be someone within the organization, an HR department? Would it be an outside investigator? Would it be their attorney? <coughs> and then you want to kind of map out the investigative process. Uh, first, generally when you make a complaint, when someone's made a complaint to you, you do what's called the initial intake to kind of assess whether, is there something to this? Should, should there be an investigation? There, there, does there need to be an investigation? If the other employee says, oh yeah, I totally did it, and you know, here's all the, whatever, you know, the, the inappropriate photos on my computer that I showed the employee, your investigation's probably going to be pretty abbreviated. But if you, you need to have you as the employer or as a person who, if you have determined you are the person that needs to be part of this process, then you have to figure out what the process is. Who needs to be interviewed? Uh, what questions need to be asked? What happened? <clears throat> so you have to figure out, generally we ask our clients, so let's figure out, is a designated person to handle complaints in your shop? In your organization, is there an HR department? and is that HR department the best to handle this? Um, <clears throat> but generally, you have, a, you, you have a chain of command. You have uh, your, your, your employees report to a supervisor, and that supervisor reports to another supervisor. You have an HR department. Uh, you have someone that's in charge of personnel that may be outside of your HR department. And so you kind of figure out, you, in your structure of your company, figure out who should be in that chain, who should be in that process. Um, <clears throat> so, Rich, for, Rich, Rich. Yes. <laughs> is it typically is it typically HR or, or what's the what's the norm? It depends, but typically it is HR. Uh, if you have if a company has a large enough uh, department to have an HR department, um, generally your mm -hmm. HR specialists or HR generalists have the experience to at least do the initial investigation. If they if they don't feel comfortable with it, and often this happens, you know, we uh, I have a friend that works for a large company, and their all their complaint all the complaints they receive are actually handled by outside investigator. It might be a lawyer, it might be just a, uh, a specialized investigator, um, and they they made that decision because they feel HR is someone that they want employees comfortable to come and talk to at any time. And so they want someone outside of the organization so that, that everyone feels comfortable, or at least everyone feels like this is a neutral party to do the investigation. Yeah. So when would you get your EPLI, like your insurance company involved? Would they do that investigation ever? Careful. They do. This is insurance. Well, right. yeah, and I sell it. <laughs> well, you sell it. I was going to sell it. I wonder, do they do the investigation? I guess I've never thought about that. Typically they don't. Uh, typically you make a claim fairly, once you've made a determination that there's something to this, that there is, uh, there may be an issue, and you want to do a further investigation, you submit, you submit a claim to your insurance carrier, 
and either the insurance carrier will have a recommendation on an investigator, or they will they will say, you know, go ahead and choose an investigator, and they will cover the they will cover the expense or part of the expense. Um, <coughs> and it's more common that uh, the once you get your insurance carrier involved, that they want to they want to know the where you are in the process. They don't necessarily want to know the answer until you get to the end. So, Rich, most of our clients, you know, don't have levels of management. They don't even have an HR department. So, when you get the call, it's either the owner or their lieutenant that says, "This is somebody complained." Mm -hmm. And I mean, is it ever appropriate for in a small company to have to do your own investigation? Yes, I would say it's a matter of time. Can do you feel like you can be uh, a neutral investigator? And not only do you, that's the first question you ask yourselves as the as the owner, but you also ask yourself: Will the employees, will the people that if the person making the complaint, and the person who the complaint was against, will they feel that you are a neutral investigator? Uh, that, in, in some respects, even, is even more important than whether you feel you are, because you want to make sure that there's both transparency and confidence in the process. But to the extent the owner ultimately is going to make a decision about something happened or it didn't and what the appropriate action is it appropriate for them to be the investigator, prosecutor, judge, appellate court? We don't, I, or at least I would say generally, I, don't, I would not recommend it. I don't feel that um, you can be a neutral observer in this, or a neutral investigator in this, uh, especially because emotions are so involved. It's your company, it's your employees that you have hired, and you may have a long-standing relationship with either the person making the accusation or the person that is accused of, of doing whatever it is. I, I think that it's uh, seldom appropriate for the owner to... So, from a risk perspective, um, it sounds like it would probably be better to get outside counsel because if let's just pretend that the small owner does the investigation and they are the they're as Jeff just said they're doing all this work and then they're deciding doesn't right. that employee that doesn't is not happy with that outcome have more um, maybe more legitimacy to seek a, a different outcome. I, I, I don't I don't think it's uh, there's anything necessarily wrong with the with the owner the, the uh, making that investigation but I think it's perception and I think you're right that the, the especially if the outcome for either the employee making the, the accusation or the person accused feels that this wasn't there was no justice in this there was no due process in this um, yeah they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna seek a lawyer they're gonna make a complaint they're gonna say Hey, I don't feel like it's treated right in this process. So there is there is a perception that if you're the person, if it's you're emotionally involved in your company, it's hard for that person to be objective. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say the one thing you want to do for the employee that's made that complaint, whether. You're a coworker, or it's uh, a subordinate, uh, an employee. You want to reassure that employee. You take it seriously. That's one thing you can do, no matter wherever you are, whether you're a coworker or not. You can be sure. Doesn't you're not saying you believe them. You're not saying that you don't believe them. You're just saying you take it seriously. You you, you understand. And this was very difficult for them to come to you to talk to you about. Rich, at that point, it, <clears throat> I would have to imagine it's okay to step away from it too and tell them, <clears throat> excuse me, tell that person I'm probably not going to be able to remain biased in this. So at this point I'm going to third party recommendation and step out of it. And I think that you can almost um, develop more of a mutual respect with that person since they know you're not going to have a camp or a foot in their camp, right? Yes. Um, I would say the, the only caveat to that, and I think it's literally my presentation, I would say you Someone's come to you. They they put their trust in you. You have to take ownership of that. You are not so involved in the investigation, um, but you they they've come to you to say, 
this happened to him, and you know how hard it was for them to come to you. So you should reassure them that you'll be there, you'll support them. Because in many respects, that's even more important than the outcome of the investigation, is to know that they one, taken seriously, and two, that someone is in their corner. And they're being hurt. They're being hurt. Um, so if someone comes to you and, and they say, this happened to me, what, what do you do? Well, you want to make sure that the discussion is, is private, because you want to be respectful of everybody. If you feel uncomfortable with it, if this is not someone that you're necessarily close to, or uh, this is a situation that you're not comfortable with, then ask if it's okay to bring in a colleague, someone else to, to hear the story, understand what's going on. And you want to protect all the parties. You want to make sure that the person who's making the accusation and the person who's being accused, uh, both their privacy, you don't actually know what happened yet, so you want to make sure that you want to keep it limited to the people who really need to know. And some people will say, well, doesn't it seem like we're trying to hide it? No, you're just trying to respect everyone's privacy. You want, you want to figure out only the people that need to know and be part of this process get to hear the story. <clears throat> Uh, if you are, and I'll jump ahead a little bit, if you are the person that's handling this a little bit more than just hearing the initial intake, you want to let the employee tell their story. And that's that's what I do. I, I, I first I don't ask any questions, I just tell me what happened. And, and then you can ask questions if not follow up with it. Then you want, you want to drill down to the details, who, what, when. Uh, often people would just sort of, because it's such an emotional thing, they'll They'll tell, you the, they'll tell you everything. They'll tell you whatever they think is important, but they won't tell you the, the important details. Who was there? Who witnessed it? When did this happen? Uh, and that's really one of the more important things is, are there any witnesses? Does anyone necessarily didn't see that specific event, but who was around before, who was around after, and can give some context to the complaint? If there was somebody. Right? If there was someone. Else. And that's a part of the, that's an important question too. Was there anyone who saw it? Uh, like I said, you want to take detailed notes. You want to listen first with care. Uh, when you write down your notes, you want to, don't include your own comments into it. Just write down, take notes about what you're hearing. Uh, and then you, you you definitely want to either scan or email notes to yourself or to whoever's appropriate, so you can get a date stamp. This is, we use a form to help us with our, our questions and our, our information. This is probably a little too small to see, but you know, we, we, for example, we have, our first sheet is sort of an intake. We get all the, the pertinent information about what, who are the parties involved, when does this happen. Our second sheet here, the middle sheet, are basically warnings that we give to uh, everybody. Uh, we talk about, you know, we're here, we, we, we don't, we haven't made any preconceived notions or making any assumptions. We just want to find out what happened. We want you to tell us your story. And we, we stress that there's no retaliation. Um, we, we, and then we start, and then we, and well, the way we do it, we lay out sort of a grid. We have sort of a, a system in how we're asking questions. <coughs> how long? With the let's say the person that made the complaint, is it an hour conversation? Is it half a day? Is it all day? I let them sort of dictate how long it will go and how how much they want to tell me and how long it will last uh, and what questions I'll ask them. It's uh, and there's no real typical. I'll say um, I've had conversations with the person making the complaint to maybe two hours, uh, but I've had to go much longer than that because they, they, it's part of a larger story they want to tell about their, their experience at the company or their experience with this particular supervisor or a co-worker. Um, this is, oh, I've had with the, one of my longest interviews took basically all day with one person and I spent the entire day with that person and she, at the end of it, she told me that she told things that she didn't even think she would tell her priest. Hmm. It was part of it, and I wasn't trying to get salacious details out of her or some 
some great story. But as I kept asking her questions, she kept telling me things that happened. She was more open about it, and she um, basically told me, not only confirmed the complaint, but told me things that uh, were important for the employer to know as they made their decision on what action to take. I, I just included, I kind of did a mock-up of how I would take notes on it uh, for a witness interview. Uh, so I take, I take, I, I, on one side of the sheet, I write down what I've told that person that I'm asking questions about, and then I start taking notes. And as you can see, I take notes in one color pen as they tell me their story. And then as they're telling me the story, I write down questions that I want to ask them in a different color pen. And then I write their answers down in a third color pen. And you, you think I'm joking? No, no. <laughs> Nuts, but, uh, <laughs> this is my pen set that I use for investigations. And do Rose and Lily know that you stole their story? <laughs> 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 but it's it's so I so I'm clear to myself when I ask things. I, I take down I write down when I, I ask questions and how long the conversation took. Um, and so I use colored pens. I use index cards when I want to write observations to myself. Like the witness was crying when, when he told me the story. Or they were fidgeting and they were very nervous. Or I write, um, often investigators don't give you um, their, how the credibility. Often investigators won't give a credibility assessment. They will simply say, they will do a findings of fact. This is what we believe happened that we, that we can show based on the witnesses. But they won't really assess the credibility of witnesses. Um, and if you if you have investigators do or you do your own investigation, we would strongly strongly recommend that you take your assessment of what happened on a different piece of paper than these notes, because these notes should be about what happened. What did you hear as an investigator? Uh, you want well, before you move on. So I assume that you want to move fairly quickly. And somebody comes and says something, and this note taking, this interview, you want to try to, whether you're doing it or whether you're reaching out for help, you want to call all the appropriate people right. and do it as soon as possible. Correct? As soon as possible, correct. You want, to, you want to keep everybody's memories fresh of what happened. I try to do it within a few days, basically, of whenever we receive the complaint from our clients. In person, not over the phone. In person, not over the phone. Uh, if you have a large organization where you have remote offices, then you or your investigation go and do the investigation in person face to face. That's the only way that you can get a sense of whether the witness is credible or not. Rich, yep. you're thinking about the credibility portion. Are you able to separate somebody that had, for lack of better words, a consensual relationship that then changed without possibly the person that's being accused? understanding is that change in taking place? From the witness statement itself, it's often, or from that, just a statement itself, from the interview itself, it's often difficult. Usually there is some more uh, supporting or, refute, or refuting evidence, contradictory evidence that shows one thing or the other. Often in our best cases, uh, we show, you know, they, they may say that, for example, uh, there were they did not voluntarily enter into a relationship with a supervisor. Uh, and we'll, as we look into it, we may find one way or the other. As we see, look at emails, texts, uh, we interview other witnesses. We, uh, in, in, our, in our age, um, it's surprising how many people use electronic communications at the office to communicate with each other and how they do not realize that they have no expectation of privacy in those communications. Uh, once we look at those communications, we generally have a fairly decent idea. For example, we, we, uh, we had a, a employee, we had a client had an employee to claim they did not have any sort of relationship with a subordinate. As we investigated, there were thousands of text messages on the company phone showing uh, of a very personal nature clearly showing there was a relationship. And then there are also receipts. Uh, uh, 
from a from a colleague doing an investigation, and it took them a long time to figure this out or to to, to get to it. But they they there was an accusation of sexual harassment uh, during a conference, and um, it was and it was a he said she said she's a situation. They couldn't really come to any conclusive evidence, but she tracked down the the person who, who the complaint was against had ordered room service, and she. And this was in a different city, obviously, because that's when that's it often happens that way. She tracked down the room service waiter, and uh, he he uh, she asked the waiter, you know, do you remember, do you remember, uh, you know, this guy? He said, oh yeah, he was a cheap SOB, <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, you know, and he he had all the details, and was able, they were able to establish that, you know, there was some it likely the accusation was likely occurred. Um, but you want you want to reassure whoever's making the complaint and whoever your witnesses are um, that they are safe from retaliation. You want you want to get to the truth. You don't want them to feel like, well, I can't tell you the truth because I don't, I'm going to be fired. Even if I'm a witness, I don't want to get involved. No, you want to reassure them. You want to know what happened. And so you're safe from retaliation. You want to assure the person that filed the complaint that the claim has been filed. Uh, you want to assure everybody that you just want to like, get to the truth. Um, if there is retaliation, you want to make sure the, that the employees report it immediately. Uh, you want to have a retaliation policy. Uh, according to EOC, uh, retaliation is the number one discrimination complaint. When I said earlier, it's not necessarily the complaint that gets you in trouble, it's how you handle it. This is what I mean. The vast, it was, I think it was like 48% of all complaints filed had to do with retaliation. Someone took <coughs> retaliation against the person making the complaint or a witness. Do you add that to the earlier investigators or have we started a new investigation? Uh, it's, I would say we started a new investigation, separate and apart from whoever the, the initial investigation. So initial this is another was sexual harassment claim? This is the second one? Right, the second one. <coughs> well, and and we've we've also made we both experienced a situation where we don't believe that the initial complaint may have occurred. And the, the initial the allegation were not at least in the way that the uh, complaint was made. But the person who was accused took retaliation against the person making the the, uh, the allegation. Then they they're in trouble for something completely different. Uh, you're going to document the retaliation complaint just as thoroughly as the original complaint. This is hard. You're going to have to employ it to be patient, uh, especially with a organization that's a larger organization, where you, or where you have an outside investigator. Where it's going to take time to kind of figure out what's happening. You may have to invest. You may have to talk to a lot of people. Um, so you're just going to ask the employee to be patient. Um, you want to do it right. And you have to you have to be patient and take the trust in the process. Um, during that process, you have to figure out whether that employee either making the complaint or is the complaints against uh, whether they're able to perform whatever their job tasks are. Um, you, as as owners, you're willing to transfer that employee to a different task, and maybe they just need to go home. Uh, for a while, while the investigation is pending. Paid or unpaid? Paid. You don't want to seem like you're punishing someone uh, before you complete the investigation. And even at the end of it, more permanent transfer might be necessary. Can I ask you a question? So in my business, and this has happened, what what about if your client, that your, your, so your employee comes to you and says, one of our clients is sexually harassing me? Um, in the case that I'm thinking of specifically, based on what I observed personally, I just asked them to find another place to do business. But if you're listening to this, I think, oh, that's kind of interesting. I guess I never really thought about that situation. Well, you don't have a you don't, you have a duty to your employee to investigate. You don't really have a duty to your client or customer to investigate. Okay. So, so, so it was okay for me to say you need to go. Right. Okay. 
I got a little nervous. May involve, a, <laughs> may involve a hostile work environment if you don't take some corrective mm -hmm. action. Right, right. If you, right. If you don't take corrective action. Okay. I just thought about when that client came back and was, was like made a claim against me saying, you believe something that I don't think was trustworthy, but I'm just going to let it go. Then. I'm going to go with what you just right. said. They can complain. Okay. They can complain about it, but you don't have a duty to investigate for them. Uh, you want, I mentioned this earlier, you want to freeze all the evidence. Um, you would be surprised at how people try to destroy, delete emails, messages, what have you. <laughs> and how unsuccessful they generally are on it. Um, it's, if we tell, if you put it out there, it's there forever. Um, and there, there's often, there's often even video evidence of whatever's happening. Uh, you just want to conduct a, a fair and thorough investigation. Be respectful, professional. You want to focus on the facts as much as possible. Take the emotion out of it, and you you want to be sympathetic. Uh, I you know I think I I like doing interviews. I think I'm I'm okay at doing them. And one of the things that I, I think I'm good at is being sympathetic uh, while I'm doing the, conducting an interview. Um, and I'm I'm careful to acknowledge what's being said without, I, I try to be careful in understanding what that person hears. Not, not what I'm saying, but what that person hears me saying. So I wanted to reassure them that I, 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 I hear what they're saying, but I don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say I agree with their, what they're saying. Uh, you want to document everything in writing. Uh, and you want to you keep, keep records of your conversation. So, you know, I've had situations where I'm doing an investigation, the, the formal interview is over, and in the hallway they say something in passing. That's the key to the next part of my investigation. Uh, they mention a witness, or they, they mention a fact, or something that I didn't know. So. Uh, talk to your legal counsel, uh, especially if you get uncomfortable, if you're confused at any point, you think you this is not what you should be doing. Um, and, and definitely talk to your legal counsel about whatever conclusions you're drawing and what actions you want to take as a result of those conclusions. Uh, so you want to follow up with both person making the complaint and the person that, that the complaint was about. And you want to take appropriate action based on that investigation. The biggest risk, as I said, is how the complaint was handled. It's often not the complaint itself. Do you have any questions? I'd be happy to. Uh, yeah, so we're talking about from complaint forward. Correct. Uh, I've been hearing stuff on talk radio about how a lot of companies are saying people shouldn't travel together, they shouldn't stay in the same hotel, they shouldn't share a cab, they should, maybe shouldn't even be on the same flight, they maybe shouldn't even be going to the same conferences, work teams are being structured differently. Uh, so what about pre-problem, I'm getting off track a little bit, but pre-problem, do you have some kind of outlines or guidelines or templates that you can share with, with folks because, uh, you know, if there's some planning on the front end, maybe we never get to or hopefully don't get to the problems. <coughs> uh, so I would say that the number one thing that employers can do to reduce their risk of a sexual harassment complaint, not have alcohol at functions. <laughs> because, I, and, and I, I understand there's a difference between correlation and causation, but I would say that just about every complaint that I've investigated where I think there is some truth to the matter, alcohol is involved. And it's often a work party. So I, I, I would say, in a broader sense, I would say that uh, you're expecting people to act professionally. So there are, there are companies that have very uh, strict rules about interaction between employees, stay in the same, ho same hotel, a floor of a hotel, or work trips, um, uh, what they can do, what they should do in meetings. Um, and, and I agree with that, but it's hard, especially in a smaller company, when you have a limited staff. Um, and also you expect your staff to 
to act professionally. You, you expect your employees to act professionally. So this could have rules that have guidelines. But um, do you have those that you could help somebody through if they wanted to create some of that stuff? We, we have we have sort of rules of, as part of our uh, sort of our, our base employee handbook. But I would say I, we can we can create a, a standalone as if, if we need to. But we can help people with it. Yes. Uh, but, if, but it's really uh, a culture. So you can have right. a handbook that has all the proper language, but really a culture of respect and. That is going to help prevent that. Right. And I just, you know, with a few years of experience, alcohol is, is like 99% of the time, uh, and then it loosens inhibitions. Right. <laughs> and not everybody's at the same level of everybody else. Well, and there's the, the old stereotype of the, the crazy drunken company Christmas party. There's a reason that's a stereotype. There, there are, we, we definitely have investigated events coming off of holiday parties where alcohol is involved. And we, understanding that you want your employees to have a good time, you want everyone to have an opportunity to blow off some steam, um, but that's, it's simply gonna be a risk. Sarah? Yeah. Well, do you think employees know that? I like, would, wouldn't you as an employer like say, hey, you know, this is where all these sexual harassment complaints are coming from. We are providing alcohol and you need to do your best to manage that. Otherwise, you know, you can be, a, you know, you are likely that you're going to engage in this behavior and it's not appropriate. Do, do companies do that? I mean, I think that's a really direct way to that's do it, but like a waiver? Yeah. <laughs> okay. But just reminding people, you know, a reminder that you're still on company. So it can be time. You're company still, time, or however it's, you know, stated. It's a company function. Uh, yes, we, I think employers should re reinforce to the employees that these events are company events. The, the, the handbook still applies, the rules still apply. And the fact that you've had five drinks doesn't make it okay. Right. I think that would be helpful because I think people do forget. I mean, they're like they feel like they're at the local bar and right. that all things are okay now because well, you gave and, me alcohol. Right, and they, they are at the local bar, right? They're often at the right. at some place fun that they've been to, and they think they can act a certain way and then forget that they're really at a work function. They don't think the annual sexual harassment training is enough. I mean, you can't just check the box and oh, we were trained. Right. It really is about the culture that you have in your organization. Um, I mean, we have, you would think, over time you'd think, gee, I've heard it all, and inevitably somebody calls, and it's like, oh my God, how did that happen? <laughs> right. It's because we're born without common sense now. Yeah. So it's just, it's, it, and it happens regardless if it's at a, you know, at a bar or a work function or whatever, it just people don't hit their off button. Um, and I think we run into that even in my situation being, I deploy people out on jobs, so I have, dual agency at many times where I've got to be able to do the investigation on the behalf of my placement, then I also have to share that information and be involved with the investigation mm -hmm. of the other employee or vice versa. So mm -hmm. it, it does happen a lot with, um, with what you're saying with the alcohol involvement. And nowadays companies, larger companies honestly don't have work functions anymore where alcohol is involved or they're not the ones who are buying the tickets for them. Mm -hmm. So that eliminates their liability. True. Yeah. And we, we also have had situations where, um, you know, someone has said to us, oh, you know, I, I just have uh, just guys in my, in my shop, you know, we, there's, there's not a chance of sexual harassment. And then they, they, they all go out and they go have some fun and they, of course, harass a waitress or a, someone else, another customer. And, you know, that's still a violation of the company handbook. It's still, it, it still endangers the reputation of the company, endangers your relationship with your, with your clients. So, you know, it, it doesn't, it's, it's also, it's not limited to male, female, employee, employee kind of situations. The other thing I think is helpful to understand is that the appropriate action is not necessarily termination of the employee. Um, I have one that I'm involved in, it's out of the state, but a, an alleged conversation happened between an officer and a vendor. And the vendor complained. 
So we've started an investigation, but it's like, even if everything that was said is true, it, we wouldn't fire the person. You know, we'd talk about what was appropriate, we'd do some training, we'd probably do training across the whole enterprise, but a lot of times I think people assume that every time something inappropriate happens, somebody has to be fired. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. You have to go through the investigation and figure out what happened and what's the appropriate response to what happened. So, it's been a few years since I was on 3M's payroll, but back 10 years ago, and for several years prior to that, if you were accused of harassment, you basically were treated as guilty until you could figure out how to prove yourself innocent. Is that still the, the Which one? is retaliation. <laughs> Well, Probably some sort of retaliation. And I, I, I repeat ad nauseum in my, in my discussions with the, whoever's making the complaint, whoever's accused. If I'm doing the investigation, I make no assumptions. I don't, I, don't, I, I, I try very, very hard uh, not to make someone prove that this is true. What I do want to do, to do is tell me what happened. And just be very straightforward. Tell me what, what happened. Um, and what sometimes happens is they don't think what they did was harassment, but it really did violate the rules. And so you know, there's that. And then there's uh, uh, there are also situations where they really didn't do anything wrong, um, or if they did something wrong, it may be a violation of the rules, and, then, and it didn't happen exactly the way the, the person making the accusation is. But I'm never going to know that unless they tell me what happened. Because, and also because when they tell me what happened, oftentimes there's someone that can support their story, or I find out there's someone that can refute their story. The other thing you'll often hear is, uh, Rich, I want to tell you about this, but I don't want you to do anything about it. Like, no, I can't do that. Now, once you've told me, now we have an <coughs> obligation to investigate. And you just have to say, I'm sorry, that's what the deal is. Right. Yeah. There's, as an employer, there's no such thing as just gossip about another employee. Now we did have a situation where supervisor self-reported. He came in and said, I've had a relationship with a staff person. He said consensual. She now wants me to give her money or they're gonna she's gonna turn me in. So he just came and turned in. The person that he had a relationship with refused to cooperate. So at the end, you know, the investigation, we couldn't, I mean, we couldn't show that he did anything wrong except his own personal assertions. Now, she never came back to work. We ended up paying her to leave to get a release, but she never cooperated in the investigation at all. So these have, this, there is no limit to what things that can come up. <coughs> Uh, if you talk to an, if you talk to someone who's in HR or who investigates complaints, yeah, there are, there are stories you would not think that people would do the things that they do, but they really do do the things that they do. I think my admonition from all of this, and Rich is kind in that maybe you could investigate it yourself. Absolutely not. And it's not just legal counsel. It's somebody that's skilled in these investigations because there's a way. Rich asked question, and this is something I wouldn't have told my priest, but somehow they get, you know, Rich and the people that do this stuff, they get it. Um, the other thing is that I think the good ones are good about assessing credibility and saying, who do you believe? So that you can, because now I'm the decision maker and I gotta make a choice. And uh, I was up at the center and there was an allegation between members, something that someone thought was inappropriate, and we hired an investigator, and in the end, the investigator said, I think what they alleged happened, but I don't think it was inappropriate. I mean, I think they took it wrong, and I don't think we should do anything about it. Okay, thank you. But, you know, went through the investigation, that was the result. Rich, thanks.